Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day. The first and only FDA approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEBroadcasting.com and sign up today. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gell, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Glaucoma is the third leading cause of blindness in the United States and worldwide. Six million Americans have glaucoma and half of which don't know they have it. Glaucoma typically has no symptoms. Is glaucoma simply Alzheimer's disease of the eye? Well, today's guest, Dr. Harvey Fishman, MD, PhD, Stanford ophthalmologist, has given this topic a lot of thought. Harvey, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie. You're the best. Well, thank you, Harvey. So let's get into it. What exactly is glaucoma? I think that you did a fantastic description. I think that we need to reset our understanding of glaucoma. And I think that the concept of Alzheimer's for the optic nerve is really a really interesting way of thinking about it. And I do think, Carrie, that we should be thinking about glaucoma as a neurodegenerative disease because in fact, it is a neurodegenerative disease. The optic nerve in glaucoma is what degenerates. Um, and there are a lot of things that people talk about, you know, in terms of pressures and trauma and drops. And there's a lot of shrubbery I like to talk about, you know, in terms of, of, of like how the confusion of what is glaucoma? Is it pressure? Is it this? Is it that? But the reality is, is it's really important to focus on the anatomy and the physiology of what's going on. And it comes down to it's the optic nerve dying off. And people have to, under, when I try to explain glaucoma, it really is an optic nerve degeneration. It's, it's like your, and, and of course the optic nerve is essentially like an extension of your brain. So Alzheimer's disease is where we start to lose cognitive function. And it, there's a lot of different components that go into why people um, you know, develop Alzheimer's dementia and other types of neurodegenerative diseases in the brain and other parts of the body. But with, with the eye, it's the same thing. It's a nerve. It's simply a nerve that's, that's losing function and starts to die. In fact, to be more specific, as, as you know, the optic nerve is really not a single nerve, it's a bundle of nerves. And I really like to emphasize, and I like to think about that, the, that this nerve, which is basically brain tissue or neuro tissue, is dying off and glaucoma is the condition whereby this dies off. And that is, that's a very simple description, in my opinion, of the process, but the, what's actually causing it, just like Alzheimer's disease, what causes it and how to fix it obviously is, is, is challenging because it's a neurobiology base. It's, a, it's something that's based in neurobiology. Somebody that has glaucoma, is there a greater risk for them to get Alzheimer's disease later on? There are some studies that do indicate that people who have, uh, have glaucoma do have a higher risk of Alzheimer's, but it may not be as simple as, as what the, the description is. In, in other words, it might be that the risk factors that go into getting Alzheimer's are, the similar, are similar to the risk factors that go into getting glaucoma. And so the answer is yes, if you, know, if you, if you develop glaucoma, your risk uh, in some studies show that you do have a slightly higher rate of Alzheimer's, but that may have nothing to do with the specifics of like getting glaucoma and then getting Alzheimer's. It just may be, for instance, if you have a high inflammatory component 
um, in your nervous system. So like they think that Alzheimer's disease, there's a, it's a huge, it's an inflammatory disease to some extent, a vascular disease. And it's the same thing for glaucoma. It's like the same idea is like if you have heart disease, um, your chances of getting stroke are higher. But just because you get a heart, just because you have a heart attack doesn't mean you're going to get a stroke. It's just the risk factors are the same. And that's exactly the same thing that's true for Alzheimer's disease and, and glaucoma. We've always thought that glaucoma meant high pressure in the eye. Is it, is it that simple or is it more than that? Right. It's so, it's so much more complex than just pressure. And in fact, if you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, definition of glaucoma by the American Glaucoma Society, AGS, um, and other definitions, pressure does not even enter into the definition of glaucoma because it's the same, like, it's the same thing as Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, what, what, one of the things that we think causes Alzheimer's disease is, um, you know, basically, you know, having a bad health in terms, excuse me, like having bad heart disease or having high cholesterol. So it's the same kind of thing that with, you know, just because you have high cholesterol and you get Alzheimer's, you know, and that puts you at greater risk for Alzheimer's, the same thing is true for, um, for glaucoma. If you have heart disease, um, and the same process that goes into causing heart disease can also cause glaucoma. It's the same thing that it may be that there are other, other factors that go into causing the pressure to get higher. Pressure is really, um, in some respect, a, an indicator of other processes going on. In fact, you know, there are some indications, and this is, there's some really interesting studies that indicate that pressure um, is, you know, really, unless the pressure's very, very high, even a moderately elevated pressure doesn't always guarantee you to get glaucoma. Um, in fact, there are so many patients who are who exist right now who have elevated eye pressure and, and don't have glaucoma. And just the opposite is true, that there's a good number of patients, some, something like the order of like 20 or even 30% of all glaucoma patients may actually have normal pressure and actually have glaucoma. Because again, it's the nerve that's getting damaged and whether the nerve, you know, it's not just pressure. Pressure may be a result of other systemic inflammatory conditions in your body or heart disease or vascular problems. So the pressure may be just one sort of an indicator. It may just be a side effect, so to speak, of the, of, or it may, it may even be the body's response to trying to, pr to protect the nerve uh, in a crazy way. Um, we just, you know, it, there may be some act, you know, aspects of why the pressure goes up that actually is the body's way to protect the nerve, just like with macular degeneration, where blood vessels are growing in and causing all this problem. And with macular degeneration, the blood vessels may actually be trying to attempt to, to heal the problem. In fact, it doesn't. We don't want to get into macular degeneration, but it's a very complex uh, process. And I think you really have to think about glaucoma as, a, as a, a large number of issues, a large number of risk factors that can go into damaging this nerve. 16% of people who get glaucoma actually go blind in both eyes. Can you explain the difference between blindness from glaucoma and say macular degeneration and some other eye diseases? Yeah, and we might want to go back to what is blindness. I mean, blindness basically means that your central vision uh, goes down below, I think it's 2200 best, in other words, the best abil the ability to vary to the best correct somebody. So it's not without glasses. I'm saying when you have contact lenses or glasses, the best you can get is 20 over 200 in terms of visual acuity. And the issue, the question then is whether, um, you know, with, with any kind of blindness, if that, if that central visual acuity goes down, um, then we, we hit that definition. So the difference, for instance, with glaucoma um, is that uh, it, doesn't always affect the central vision. Often it affects the peripheral vision, your side vision, so, or, or chunks of your vision. So you could have, you can have like part of your vision in glaucoma can be perfectly 20-20, but then another part is you just have it's complete blackness and blindness in that, in that section. So think of the, you know, the world that you're looking at, you know, if, if it would almost like imagine like a keyhole or like some kind of a, of a Pac-Man kind of, uh, of uh, appearance to how you see the world. Like you see everything except there's a little Pac-Man bitten out of the circle uh, where, you, where you can't see it. Um, and like a, like a wedge defect almost, like a wedge of vision that's just gone. So that could be in your central vision, but sometimes it's in your peripheral vision in glaucoma. Um, in the case of macular degeneration, it usually hits the center part of the vision. So the types of blindness you have in the different diseases are, is very different depending on the disease process and the type of 
um, you know, condition you have, but the end result is that your central vision goes. Now there are definition, I mean, you know, you can, you can um, in some cases in retinal diseases, you can actually have the peripheral vision um, can, can, um, can be maintained and the central vision is gone. Uh, and then in glaucoma, you could actually have just the opposite. You could have almost perfect central vision. In fact, you could have a very, very, very small little area right in the center of your vision that's absolutely perfect and crisp, but then you can only see, you can't see anything beyond this very, very narrow tunnel vision. That can also happen in retinal disease, by the way, as you know. As you know. The most common cause of glaucoma, the most common type of glaucoma in the U.S. is open glaucoma. Okay. Other parts of the world, other parts of the world is a narrow, what we call narrow angle glaucoma. Right. What kind of symptoms are there for open angle glaucoma or open glaucoma to the, to the layman? Right. So for open angle glaucoma, they almost describe one of the descriptions of, of open angle glaucoma is sort of the silent, the silent thief of your, of your vision. Because um, generally, in, uh, generally with people with open angle glaucoma, they usually have one eye gets affected at a time doesn't mean you can't have both but usually one eye can start getting a decrease in vision um, progressively and because we have two eyes and because we're are so binocular in our world having one one eye can slowly get worse without even knowing it and so you can be in a situation where you could be you could lose half your vision in one eye and never even know it in fact, I see that quite often in clinic where somebody will come in and they could be going on for years not knowing that they have a particular part of their vision that's gone just because they just didn't notice it. And what age group is it glaucoma most common in? So you'll have to back me up on the statistics um, in terms of the numbers. Uh, obviously, people older than the age of 60, uh, older than 55 to 60 is where the glaucoma starts to increase in number especially when you get into your 60s and 70s, certainly in 80s, uh, it's much more prominent. Um, that doesn't mean you can't have glaucoma in your, in your, as a child. Um, there are plenty of cases of congenital, born, your kids are born with glaucoma. And of course, there are lots of people who are born with glaucoma, um, excuse me, who develop glaucoma even in their early teens um, or, or in 20s. So it's, it's a disease that affects a, 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 broad, a wide variety of different groups. And it, different types of glaucoma tends to you know, affect different age groups. So for instance, um, there are certain groups that tend to have a slightly higher rate at a lower age, at a younger age than, than other types of, of conditions. And you had, and, and you know, you'd mentioned one thing, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you'd mentioned one thing about like, what's the difference, or you brought up an open angle versus a closed angle glaucoma. And um, really, in, until your pressure goes really high, and the pre if the pressure is getting super high to the point where the eyeball is, is so pressurized that the cornea starts to get fluid in it and fluid starts developing, um, that's where you can start noticing it um, from a physical standpoint. You, that's where the vision you know, get, really will decrease quite a bit um, if, it's, if somebody comes in with very high pressure. But what's interesting is the body is, 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 has this unbelievable ability to compensate at very slow levels. So when glaucoma um, you know, it's not uncommon to see somebody come in with very high pressures and the eye looks normal, for, at least from, you know, from their perspective. But then when you measure their pressure, it's like sky high. And the reason is that their body just slowly compensates for that gradual increase in pressure that, that occurs over the, you know, as time goes on. And then at some point, their body, the eyeball just can't compensate. And then it starts to fill up with fluid like the cornea, for instance, and then things go really quickly. Um, and then you really notice it. And then you can, also, you can also have pain uh, when it gets to that level because then the cornea starts uh, having problems. But it's interesting that if you were to take like the average person, Carrie, um, you or me, we, and presumably we have normal pressures. Um, and, you know, if you were to take our pressure and you were to like jack it up, like so normal pressures, you know, in the teens, you know, ideally in the teens or in we should talk about what normal is because there really isn't a normal, but uh, the average pressure that's considered in the sort of the normalish range is in the teens to low twenties. And if you were to take our pre and let's just say you and I run at that pressure all the time. And if you were to take our pressure and jack it up to like 50 or 60, and by the way, these numbers are millimeters of mercury. I should point that out. So if you jack, you take the pressure and go up to like 50 or 60 millimeters of mercury, um, we're going to be in pain. 
because that's an abrupt change. Whereas, you know, the average, you know, whereas some of these patients who have open angle where it just goes really gradually, you know, in those situations, uh, it's going so gradually, they don't even notice, the, it's, it's, they don't even notice the pressure going up. And it's very much like the description I make, like the frog getting boiled in a pot. It's, you know, you can gradually increase that temperature and the, the frog's doing fine until it hits 100 degrees Celsius and then, and then it's not doing fine. Uh, that's a great point because it's very common to see a patient who has a pressure of 35, 40, where anything, say, under 20 is what we may consider normal, but have a pressure of 35 or 40, which is very high pressure, has a lot of damage to the nerve of the eye and is starting to go blind from glaucoma, and the patient is asymptomatic. They have no symptoms just because of what you're saying. Right. It's, it's, and that's what's so tricky about it. And... The other thing that's tricky is that pressures change. They can change from the morning to the evening. And so, I mean, in terms of screening patients, you know, and we'll, maybe we'll, we'll get into that, of course, but, you know, the reason why we go and we want people to get checked periodically for their pressure is because you won't know that you have glaucoma until you actually check the pressure um, and, and other things as well. And, and let's go, and I, and I don't want to harp on pressure because, again, you know, it's like what I said in the beginning, just because the pressure is high doesn't mean you're, you have glaucoma. It just means your pressure is high. It's like a risk factor for glaucoma. And similarly, you know, if your pressure is low, you can still have glaucoma, even with low pressure, quite, quite a bit. And I, I do want to talk a little bit about my theory on why or how I think about glaucoma in that respect. But, but the most important thing is to understand that you do need to go in to see your optometrist, your ophthalmologist, to get just simple screening stuff. Because if you don't know it, you know, you're just, you could be going on for years. And then just because, and, and the other thing is just because you had a good pressure one year doesn't mean you don't have a good pressure the next year. And so like people, you know, often get a really good, get, good, get a good report card from you or me from in the office and they're all excited. And, but that doesn't mean that, you know, two years or a year, even six months later, it could change. And so, you know, most Americans are, and people in the world are, are excellent about getting, generally getting their blood pressure measured, getting their cholesterol measured, because they know the risk factors. But the awareness of eye diseases, I think, is not as much as we would like as eye professionals. And we need to inform people that, you know, you need to get checked more often because you just don't know. It goes back to like, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And, um, you know, if, if it's, it's a little bit like the COVID-19 virus, unfortunately. We don't know who's sick. Who's not, if you don't know who's sick, you don't know how to deal with it. So you need to test people, and we need to test people with, uh, with glaucoma because it's exactly what you said, that sometimes you go asymptomatic. That's a good reason to have your eyes examined on a yearly basis because once you see a patient who has gone blind from glaucoma, it's a horrible thing knowing that in many Many times it could be prevented. That blindness is very preventable. Right. And I think it's important for people to know that, you know, we, we like to get reminders by the optometrist and ophthalmology office, but, you know, people move, cards fall through the cracks. And so it's really important for people to take responsibility for their own health and to take responsibility of trying to do follow ups. I mean, um, you know, the doctor's office can do just so much to get you to you know, uh, to, to go in, but it's really your responsibility, a patient's responsibility to try to get in. Um, and, and just don't take it for granted that your vision's going to be going to be good just because it was excellent, you know, last year, next year, it could be worse. It's also true, you know, I mean, just as a little side note here, you know, when you when patients come to see you and I, Carrie, you know, one of the things we do is a visual field, and we'll talk a bit about this in terms of visual field testing as part of glaucoma. But visual field can also, as, as, you're, as you're well aware of, it can detect brain tumors. And I know that with your um, Open Your Eyes uh, film and all the work that you're doing to make people aware of, of what you can learn through, through the eye exam, which is phenomenal, um, one of those things not only is, 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 is glaucoma, is, 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 is brain tumor, uh, because you can actually see visual field defects. So again, it's really important to stay up on that, and on that stuff. And to also realize that when you go in to see your eye doctor, it's not just about getting glasses. It's actually about potentially saving your life. You know, when we see a patient and we're checking them for, say, the, a disease such as glaucoma, we're checking them for many diseases because there are up to 300 systemic diseases that can manifest in the eye. And many times 
the first place it manifests is in the eye, and the eye doctor is the first one to make the diagnosis. That's right. But we're, but we're looking at it as a snapshot, almost like a bird flying from one place to another, and we're taking a picture of the bird at one spot, but we haven't seen it where it started, where it's going to end. So that's why a good yearly frequent eye exams are important because, you know, we we might not get all the information the first time because there's a lot that's involved. So that's why it's good to get checked on a, on a regular basis. But let me ask you a question about the mechanism, the cause of glaucoma. Back to you, it. Have some, you have some th theories and how much is genetics involved and how much is being healthy involved? Right. I mean, it's, that's the age old question, genetics versus, versus, you know, you know, what you, your phenotype and what you, what, what comes out of, you know, what you display genetically. I mean, everything is genetics and nothing's genetics, right? I mean, I mean, the reality is that, you know, you have, you're given the Delta, you're Delta a, a set of cards and you got what you got genetically. And so some people have a susceptibility to everything. And one of those things is glaucoma. But what's important to understand is that we all have susceptibilities to lots of different diseases, glaucoma being one of them. And it's really important um, that you understand that, that just like you're trying to prevent other diseases occur and you want to live a healthy life, um, you know, there are many things you can do to prevent glaucoma uh, just as well. And, the, and, you know, I don't know if you wanted to get into the mechanisms of glaucoma right now, but I mean, the, and this is again, something that I think about and I try to explain to my patients is that glaucoma is the optic nerve. So always go back to the, the organ. Okay. Glaucoma is not pressure. Glaucoma is not drops. Glaucoma is not this other stuff. It's an optic nerve. And the way I like to think about the optic nerve is, um, and I was trying to think about this this morning, like what gives you a, an idea of how fragile this, this thing is, but at the back of your eye, it's almost like having, um, I was trying to come up with like a good analogy, like yarn or very fragile, fragile thread, or, you know, maybe, I, so I kind of came up with angel hair pasta. Um, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, imagine you have like, you know, a million, bu you know, a bundle of angel hair pasta, you know, coming in and that's just, that's just recently been, you know, cooked. And you know how fragile pasta is, you can easily break it and, you know, it can tear. Uh, you can overcook pasta, right? You can, you know, lots of things can damage this very, this very delicate, I mean, maybe we'll, maybe we'll go back to thread. Maybe, maybe the age of hell pasta is not exactly what we should be talking about, but let's just say you have this, this delicate thread, but a very gossamer, delicate bundle of thread that's coming out of the back of your eye. And this thread, these threads or the fibers of the optic nerve can get damaged by lots of things, right? And one of the main uh, theories, one of the, uh, one of the newest theories is it's a mechanical, it's mechanical constriction. So like, if it's like, if you get your, if you get a crush injury to your arm or you get a pinched nerve, everybody understands a pinched nerve, right? You get a pinched nerve or your back. I mean, that is so clear as day, right? You know, if you're, if you start to get back, you know, back problems, it's because like I carried my kids for like, you know, 15 years and my spine starts to compress and it's, it's, it crunches on a nerve that hurts. It's painful. Um, same exact idea in glaucoma. You have nerve, these nerves, like just like in your back or your arm can get pinched. And so there are, um, there's this one group of, of thought in terms of one of the mechanisms and one of the theories uh, uh, for some patients is that you have um, you, you're actually pinching the nerve. And like, for instance, some of the patients who are really nearsighted, um, if, you have, if you're very myopic and very nearsighted, then the way the optic nerve enters into the back of your eyeball can be kind of oblique, can kind of come in at an angle as opposed to straight on. And as a result, you could actually be pinching part of the nerve. And actually, that's pretty much what they think in a lot of different cases. So there's this group, there's this collagen mesh, mesh or network uh, that's at the back of your eye called the lamina cribosa. The lamina cribosa is this meshwork of collagen that kind of holds the nerve in place. And um, there, you know, depending on the, your genetics, um, you may have thinner or thicker amount of collagen in that area. And then depending on the length of your eye and, and so forth. And so imagine that you have this thread that's sitting on your eye and it's going back and forth and back and forth all day. And eventually you can pinch it off just like you pinch off the back nerve. And so when you start pinching off those nerves, they die, they, cr they get crushed. And that's sort of one way you can think about glaucoma. And that's the mechanical theory. And there's a lot of patients, uh, Carrie, who are in that 
you know, who were in that sort of normal tension. So that's one of the things about not describing this just as, as pressure. It's actually that some patients who have very normal pressures, um, but because their nerve is pinched, uh, because of the anatomy of their eye, because of the way it comes in, they're just damaging their nerve every day. And there's not a lot you can do to prevent that, um, at least on the, on the pressure side. So you have to do other things to try to enhance to prevent that nerve from dying. And you know, we'll get into, hopefully we'll get into discussing like some of the risk factors, things you can do to try to, pr to, to limit that. But again, you know, lowering the pressure is certainly one of them, but that nerve tissue, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, you don't want to inflame it. So it could be that there's this big inflammatory component of glaucoma and that, you know, anything you can do to, pr to lower the inflammation of anything, including the nerves in your body, can go to prevent the, the ongoing damage of the, of the nerve. And that's similar to Alzheimer's disease. A lot of people think that Alzheimer's disease and dementia, it's a neuroinflammatory disease, inflammation in the brain, and that some of the things we see in the brain that occur, like the amyloid plaques and, the, and, the, and all these proteins that tangle up in the brain with Alzheimer's disease, really is a response to inflammation. And there, there is a thought in glaucoma similarly that you that you can actually cause inflammation in the nerve, um, and that that is really the basis for why you 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 lose the nerve, you pinch the nerve, or you kill the nerve, and then you get glaucoma. So that's just one theory. That's the that's the mechanical theory. Of course, you know as you know there are other ones. There's vascular. There's um, just just the nerve not being functioning is not functioning through what's called a neurotrophic effect, meaning that that neurotransmitters that are supposed to be uh, going back and forth are not, are, are not occurring. Um, and then, of course, pressure is one of them uh, that's a risk factor. That it's, again, pressure might lead to compression of the vasculature or compression of the nerve itself. So those are like some of the main theories of, of glaucoma. Macu Health, your science-born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. Patients are often referred in from primary care because they're on certain medications to see if they're allowed to take the medication, if they are, say they already have glaucoma. Maybe right. A little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. I mean, and that, and that comes down to one of the things that we, when we talk about glaucoma, um, you know, it, it gets back to the types of glaucoma. So again, remember, it doesn't matter what type of glaucoma there are like, I don't know how many different categories of subtypes of glaucoma, the end result's the nerve dying. But one of the subtypes of glaucoma is an anatomic description of the glaucoma. And that is, as you, as you alluded to, either closed angle or open angle. And so um, if you have a, an eye that's really short um, or it's really, a, we, we call sort of a congested angle where the, where the, flu, the, the fluid in the eye is un, unable to escape, then, um, that pressure can go up very quickly or can go, and that's sort of this hot, this angle, this closed angle mechanism. And so when people, when they talk about different types of medicines, much of the time they're talking about medicines like cold medicines that actually cause the eyes to dilate. When your eyes, when the pupil dilates, uh, in the case of, for instance, a closed angle person, um, that pupil can dilate and then the pressure can go up very quickly. And then when the pressure goes up, then you start compressing the nerve. So the pressure itself is not the problem, it's the damage to the optic nerve. The pressure goes really high and it's, it, it compresses probably the vasculature, it compresses the nerve itself and then the nerve will die. And that can be irreversible in many cases. And so how, that, about, yeah, go how ahead. about people that are on oral steroids? You know, they have right. some kind of, uh, they have some kind of uh, lung issue when they have to be on a steroid. Yeah, that's right. So you have, um, you know, again, we, we know that steroids can increase the pressure. And, I, and I, it's, it's unfortunate that we keep coming back to pressure, 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 because I don't, because we, you know, you really don't want to think about this as a pressure problem. You want to think about it as a nerve getting damaged problem. But it's important to understand that with steroids, the pressure goes up in the eye, which then leads to damage to the nerve. And so when you take oral steroids, um, you can, you can really get the pressure high. And it turns out that for, for, for whatever genetic reasons, there are some people who um, have a more, who are more susceptible to the steroid causing pressure increase in their eye than other people. So we call that, there are some patients we call steroid-dependent glaucoma or steroid-dependent ocular hypertension for another name of this. 
And so it's really important to, to know that those, that steroids, um, and it can be in any form, uh, oral steroids are particularly uh, bad, um, but steroids, for instance, uh, like there, there are patients of mine who are dependent on, who have, who are sensitive to, to pressure increase from steroid or steroid responsive steroid, you know, whatever, steroid responsive patients, sensitive patients. And if they lather on a lot of the steroid cream that dermatologists give them, like for instance, if they have psoriasis or some other dermatologic, um, you know, problem, often dermatologists will give them a steroid cream. Enough of that steroid cream will absorb into your body and actually cause the pressure to go up. And I've, I've absolutely seen that. The other one that's notorious is, is inhalers. Uh, people who take steroid inhalers can make the pressure go up. A lot of times, a lot of times the, you know, the ophthalmologist or the pulmonologist or the doctor will, patient will say, well, what about, is this a problem? And, you know, the reality is that for most people, a small amount of pressure increase over a small amount of time is not, is not a big deal. But if you are a, you know, if you have like a, a perfect storm, let's just say you have a little glaucoma, which went unidentified and you are steroid responded. Uh, excuse me, steroid dependent or steroid sensitive. Um, and then you're on steroids for six months because of whatever pulmonary disease, then you could actually have enough pressure that could actually go on to damage the optic nerve. So, so to answer your question, there's a ton of medicines that um, are, can cause steroid, can cause glaucoma or can make it worse. Steroids are a big one. Um, cold medicines, like if you take phenylephrine, anything with um, ephedrine, like you know, Sudafed, for instance, and there's a lot of cold medicines that sneak Sudafed in there um, or ephedrine because um, that causes the pupils to dilate. And then there are a lot of natural, there's a lot of natural medicines, a lot of natural, you know, pr food products and so forth that can actually cause the pupils to dilate um, and so forth. So you have to be, so, you know, I think it's important to ask, and I get this question a lot, which is like, you know, my doctor wants me to put me on this medicine and is this going to affect my glaucoma or whatever? And so majority of patients who don't have narrow angle, it's generally not a problem. But, you know, if it's a steroid, it can be a problem. And right. Then, but, you know, but one of the things I always tell my patients is that, you know, if you don't, if you can't breathe, then you don't have a person. Right. <laughs> you know? So we want to keep you alive. And, you know, so it's like, you know, there's a hierarchy to what, you know, what we do. So, you know, Lung, lung beats pressure. So if you need to live and you, and, you know, and, you're, and you can't get, if you have emphysema or you have really bad lung disease and you need to be on steroids, that takes precedence. So I always kind of joke in a nice way with my patients. I say, look, you know, you know, if you need to take the steroids, you let your pulmonologist take, give them whatever, you know, let them give you that. I'll deal with the pressure. Okay. Don't not take the, don't not take the oral prednisone, you know, just because you have, a, maybe your pressure goes up a little bit. Right, we could always deal with the pressure, but you want to get examined. So if you're on an inhaler that has Simba, like Simbacord or Flovent yes. or Advair that has a steroid in it, you want to make sure that you're getting your eyes examined because that could raise the pressure, just like you said. Yeah, and the other thing that's really scary is that there's a lot of OTCs, a lot of over-the-counter medicines now that actually have steroids. I couldn't believe it. I was in Costco, you know, six months ago, and Flonase, which is, you know, Flonase is on the market. You know, I mean, that's, you know, they talk about all these medicines that they don't allow into the market because the FDA doesn't. I mean, I think that that's a pretty dangerous medicine on, as an over the counter, because, you know, I mean, I don't think they were thinking about, you know, steroid increase and, in you know, pressure increase when they made that OTC. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's OTC, but it could cause glaucoma. So if Absolutely. you're on those medicines, you really, you really need to get checked. Yeah, just because it's OTC doesn't mean it's safe. Exactly. So let's talk about some of the uh, risk factors, some other, some other risk factors. Uh, let's talk about sleep apnea. Oh, great. I, I mean, that's a really important one. That's a super important one. I know that's one of your favorite topics. I have personal experience with that. <laughs> you know, I, um, and, and, and the thing about sleep apnea is, uh, the funny thing about sleep, and I'll describe sleep apnea in a second, but sleep apnea is either incredibly overdiagnosed or incredibly underdiagnosed. It's like the it's like it, it's, it hits that Goldilocks you know principle. It's like it's amazing how many people um, you know like they 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 
the doctor thinks, oh, you must have sleep apnea, but they, you know, they just, they don't. And that there's an amazing number of people who come in who clearly have sleep apnea and just never, you know, just fell through the cracks. Now, why is sleep apnea such a, a tough one? And there's been a lot of controversy about sleep apnea over the, over the many years. And there are some glaucoma specialists who up and down and left and right do not believe that sleep apnea causes glaucoma. Um, and in fact, I, you know, I've spoken to a lot of them. Um, but, but I think the evidence is pretty strong. And so let me just explain to our audience, you know, sleep apnea, as you know, is that, you know, it's, 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 it can be as, it basically means where you basically um, obstruct the airway. Um, well, there are two types of, of sleep apnea, but the, the main one is what's called obstructive sleep apnea, where you lie down and your, you know, your airway just collapses. That's as, as simple as that. And then you end up, you know, stopping, you stop breathing. And then, um, and then you can do that many times during, during the night. And, um, and it can go completely unnoticed. And, you know, and then the other type of sleep apnea is called central sleep apnea. So you can actually have sleep apnea where your, your, your airway is fine, but your brain just doesn't uh, st signal to your diaphragm to breathe. So it's a neurologic cause of sleep apnea. But regardless of whether it's, whether it's a, you know, obstructive sleep apnea, which is the majority or, or, or one that's um, from, uh, from a central mechanism, the me main mechanism is you stop breathing. And um, there, there are a lot of things that go along, and I wanna sort of focus on the obstructive one because that's much more common. But there are a couple of theories about why this can be a risk factor for glaucoma, one of which is that you know, your, your oxygenation level goes down at night, it can drop, it can go below 90% um, uh, over the course of an evening. And if you have low oxygen, less oxygen to your brain, less oxygen to your heart, less oxygen to your optic nerve. And it's slowly, you know, killing off the optic nerve in a very slow fashion. And that's one of the mechanisms. And I think the other mechanism, which I personally believe is, is probably even more important, and I hope the more, there's more research in it, is that when you, are, when you have sleep apnea, and, and the only reason I can say this is I had sleep apnea, and getting the CPAP personally was a, literally a life changer. And I'm not particularly heavy, but I do have kind of a typical thick Russian neck, you know, my Russian background from my elders. But the Russian neck and, you know, the anatomy is such that, you know, even if you're, even if you're relatively thin, your anatomy can be such that you can, you can develop sleep apnea because of the, the extra tissue in your throat and so forth. Um, but what happens is that when, when you have obstructive sleep apnea, um, over the course of an evening, you're going to do something where you're going to start sleeping on your face. If you talk to people with sleep apnea, you will die unless you're sleeping face down or you sleep on your side or something. And the reason is you'll just stop breathing. You won't be able to survive. So, so just naturally what happens is that you will um, just normally start to sleep on your face to be able to keep that airway open. It's not a particularly great way of doing it, but it, it, it's better than not breathing. And you're and when you're asleep, you just don't, you know, there's so much that goes on when you're asleep, you don't even know it. So what happens, I think, um, is that people sleep on their face. And there are some really fascinating studies where and they use, you know, uh, overnight contact lenses. There are these special contact lenses that can sense the pressure of your eye. And some of those contact lens studies were, were just remarkable. And you can see that people who sleep on their face, their pressure can go up from, let's say, a normal pressure of like, uh, like me, like I have in, I'm in the teens, or you in the teens. Uh, your pressure can go from the teens all the way up to 30 or 40, which if somebody came in your office with a pressure of 30, 40, you wouldn't even hesitate to, to want to start treating them and start lowering their pressure immediately. So... Part of reason why sleep apnea is, is, is there's probably a large component is, is uh, of issues is that people sleep on their face. And there's another thing that goes along with sleep apnea, which is there's this condition called floppy eye, eyelid syndrome, where you actually, your eyelids kind of flop open and then you rub it and you get a bad red eye. I've had a couple patients with floppy eyelid syndrome, although it's interesting because they've done studies and this is where studies really bother me. You know, you'll see these studies that say, well, no, there's absolutely no association between floppy eyelid syndrome and, and, um, and uh, and sleep apnea, but you know it, you you see it all the time clinically, and so I, I would say this that's the other reason why sleep apnea is a really big issue. And it's got and so you know and the other thing is that you if you have all of my glaucoma patients, if I have any patient who is an uncontrolled glaucoma patient, like where I that they're with they're continually with where they're 
their visual field and their different, you know, optic nerve thickness, which are some of the measures we do to, to, you know, to determine whether they have glaucoma or not. If I see that going down at a faster rate than, I, than, I'm, than I'm happy with, then I really encourage them to get a sleep study. Because, you know, and the other thing that's a little frustrating is sometimes I'll send them to the sleep app, you know, doctor and the doctor will be, well, you know, I mean, this is where it like goes undetected. You know, it's like, well, it doesn't, it's not that bad. I don't think you need a CPAP. You know, whereas other guys, like they have nothing and they get a CPAP. Um, but, but the reality is that like, you know, when it comes to glaucoma, you know, you're trying to keep this very fragile nerve, like we talked about, you're trying to keep this fragile little thread, uh, you know, alive. And if you have a little bit of deoxygenation at night, you want to optimize everything to keep that thing alive. You know, so, so the answer is that, you know, yeah, sleep apnea, big deal, very important, needs to be looked at. And fortunately now, like a lot of the smart ophthalmologists and optometrists, you know, are starting to, 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 to you know, certainly the neuro ophthalmologists who I um, have tremendous respect for, they're now, you know, being, they're really cognizant of sleep apnea. And then they're actually sending a lot of their, you know, like people who have strokes to the optic nerve, they'll actually send them for sleep studies uh, pretty often. And I like that because I think that's an important risk factor that needs to be, to be dealt with. It, even, even if you don't have significant sleep apnea, it's probably important to make that optimized. Yeah, I mean, studies show that if you have sleep apnea, you have a 10 times greater risk of getting glaucoma. And of course, sleep apnea have an increased risk of stroke, just like to the nerve, but a, a stroke, a regular stroke. Yeah, the other thing is blood pressure. I mean, and, and that goes back to glaucoma. So one of the things that's interesting, if you look at the mechanism of sleep apnea, one of the reasons why people's blood pressure goes up is because there is less oxygenation to the body, right? So when, you're, when your oxygenation level goes down, then the brain or the heart's response and the kidney's response is to increase the blood flow. And so as a, as a compensatory mechanism to make more blood flow, to, to oxygenate the tissues in your body, the uh, blood pressure goes up. And you and become so you, more sympathetic. Right. So you can actually cure somebody's blood pressure issue just by giving them, you know, um, by, by treating their sleep, sleep apnea. And the other thing that's interesting, that goes right back to the glaucoma thing. That we know that and when, and you, I'm sure talk about hypertension, high blood pressure is another risk factor for glaucoma. So you you know by lowering oh and, and by the way low blood pressure is also a risk factor for glaucoma and again it's that Goldilocks principle. But like in the case of people with sleep apnea, you know if you if or in glaucoma if they have glaucoma and they have sleep apnea, definitely treat the sleep apnea because then if you lower first of all there's the direct effect of improving the oxygenation hopefully theoretically to the optic nerve but then secondarily if the blood pressure goes down you're just going to make them a healthier heart healthy means optic nerve healthy which means less risk factor for glaucoma and that leads us to migraines talk about the relationship between glaucoma and migraines so you know that's that's a super interesting area and in migraine is also a very interesting topic because the question is how much is it like you know calcitonin and all these different inflammatory mediators that get released um, during during a migraine attack um, but we know that migraines are in fact a vascular problem um, that in, that you know it's either a constriction or vasodilation of the vasculature which can cause problems and so we we definitely know that migraines that people who have migraine um, are at much higher risk for glaucoma. Um, and because just like you know, migraines, just like the vascular component of migraines, you have a vascular component of, um, of, of glaucoma where the blood vessels might get cons constricted. And then there's less blood flow to this very delicate, you know, should I say angel hair pasta? <laughs> or should I very delicate gossamer thread. We'll just call it gossamer thread. I think that's a better way. Gossamer bundle of threads. And same thing is true is that, you know, just like the vasculature can cause uh, problems with migraines and, and release um, different uh, inflammatory mediators that then inflame the, the dura and other parts of the brain during migraine, same thing can happen in glaucoma. And I should also point out that other similar conditions like Raynaud's disease, I don't know if you were going to mention that, but Raynaud's disease where, you know, people where they get like one of their fingers gets cold or one of their hands gets cold. Um, again. Sorry. What's that? Poor circulation. Poor circulation, same thing. And obviously, and that you know goes right into smoking. I mean, I don't need to say that smoking is not a good thing for you, but 
if you have glaucoma, you have to stop smoking. <laughs> you know, that is just, or, or if you have a risk factor, you cannot smoke. I mean, not that that, that goes without saying, but again, the vascular search just gets trashed with, with smoking. Talk about people with metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, people at risk for diabetes. They're at, their pressure is always up a little bit, it seems like. Yeah, and I mean, and again, it's a good, it goes back to that vascular issue um, and overall, you know, uh, effect on the on tissues. I mean, diabetes just wrecks the body, um, and it certainly wrecks the vasculature quite a bit. And that, and you and I often will pick up diabetes in patients, you know, years before they even have it. And I know you have some really cool techniques in your office to do that as well. Um, and you know, we both have OCT and geography although your device is a little better than mine, <laughs> but um, you have, but the, the reality is that, uh, you know, the, the, with, with respect to the vasculature and, and, and uh, you know, and what it, and the, the havoc that diabetes causes on the, the very, very small blood vessels that supply all sorts of parts of our body, kidney, heart, and brain, obviously um, it has the same effect on the optic nerve. It, it, kills off the optic nerve. And so glaucoma is just, I mean, excuse me, diabetes is just one more risk factor for, um, you know, for damage to the optic nerve. Although it's interesting, there was a study, there was an interesting study back in the day, I think it was part of the OATS study, but I, don't quote me on that. And, I, and it was interesting because they did find in one of these clinical studies, they looked at pressure, right? And they were looking at like, you know, I think it was like ocular hypertension treatment trial. And they looked at all these different things. It turns out that patients with diabetes actually had a lower risk. Yes, that was in the OATS study. Remember that? Yeah, but I don't think anyone really buys that. Well, so no, I think that the reason it could have been secondary, the fact, this is interesting, it could be, and again, this is total theory off the thing, but like one of the things that people think is metformin is actually protective against optic nerve. So, so I don't remember how they ruled this, how they were, I mean, if they were able to you know, tease out that data. But the other thing is it turns out metformin, which people use for diabetes, tends to be protect, they think that that's protective against, um, against glaucoma. So it could be that the patients who, had, who actually had diabetes uh, who were on metformin may have actually been protecting themselves with metformin. But that's just, you know, I mean, but that just shows the complexity of this incredibly complex disease. But that's true. They're looking at metformin as an anti-aging medication. That's right. And anti-aging, of course, is anti-neuro. It's, it's neuroprotective. So they think metformin is a very neuroprotective drug. But you know, you and I are not guys who like to to put pharmacy pharmacy in people. And I like to try to do it naturally. There are a lot of anti-aging. There are a lot of ways you can you know you can make your health better without taking metformin and other things. Um, and it goes back to what we said is, you know, if you can treat the, if you can improve the underlying pathology, the tissue through more, you know, natural ways of doing things, you always, always go, always go that route first. But, you know, we all, everybody in America, we all like to get the magic pill or the magic eye drop to make things get better. And, you know, you know we're all susceptible to that because there's a practicality that you need to, you know, that you need to deal with. But we're not going to get on that. We won't get on that topic yet. Gary, <laughs> let's talk about how glaucoma could affect reading. Yeah, so glaucoma, you know, again, it goes back to what we said, which is that if you have different, like, parts of your vision fractured, like little Pac-Man, uh, little wedge defects in your visual field, you know, it's certainly in the peripheral vision, you know, that can affect your ability to read. Like, if, you're, if you have glaucoma in one eye, not the other, um, as you're scanning across the page, you know, you might be missing particular letters. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, you and I with our big schnoz. So my, you know, my left, uh, my, my left eye here, <laughs> this part of my visual field, right? This part of my visual field, uh, is, is, is being blocked by my schnoz from my left eye. Okay. So that's where my no, that's where my right eye can pick things up. Right. So if I'm reading and all of a sudden my, the letters are getting blocked by my schnoz, on the left eye, then of course the right eye has to pick up and you know put the images together. But if I have glaucoma in the right eye, that's where I can start missing letters. So it can actually affect reading. So for people that it affects reading, what can they do? Any kind of techniques that you recommend? I don't know. That's more like your area. <laughs> that's something you might know a little better about. I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that being able to enhance reading um, is tricky because if you're missing part of your visual field, I mean, there are these like 
weird glasses that can, you know, these lenses that can sometimes, they're called hemi-field, I don't know, prism lenses. And there's some interesting lenses that people, that people use, like in the case of a, of a huge visual field defect from a stroke. And I think that they've shown that they can be helpful. Uh, Ellie Pelly, I think in, at Harvard, has done some really interesting work on these, I think they're called hemianopsia lenses. I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, but I mean, obviously, if you have glaucoma and you're missing part of your visual field, you know, things like, you know, if, if, if it's really, a, if it's a small little area, you could obviously make the letters bigger. You could use larger screens. Make sure you're, you know, obviously make sure you optimize your, the, the reading glasses that you're using. Um, lighting is super important. That's the other thing that's really interesting that um, I actually work with this cool company called Jasper Ridge. Um, and, you know, some of the work I did in light sensitivity, trying to understand light sensitivity, um, you know, is, um, has been uh, a passion of mine. And one of the things that we use is this device that can, um, that can, that can put different levels of light on a page and people with lower vision or low vision patients, they do better with better lighting. So I can't under emphasize how important lighting is, making sure your visual correction is perfect, you know, up to date, that kind of thing. Yeah. You can use reverse polarity with the computer. If you're looking at a computer where you're using white letters on a black background rather than black letters on a white background, which is actually helpful. I was going to make a really bad joke. Like maybe she got a nose job. So you can see the other part of it. Cause like I, if, if I get glaucoma, I'm in big trouble with my nose. <laughs> uh, I play softball. I always had to make sure I have both eyes facing me, <laughs> so I don't black off one eye from my yeah. from from the schnoz. So let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk about driving. Yes. What's the what happens with driving in glaucoma, and when is it where you know you can't drive a car anymore? Right. So you know the the DMV part of the um, testing when when people have low vision or vision problems and they come into you and I and they give us that DMV form famous DMV form, part of it is, you know, visual acuity, but then part of it is visual field. And we're supposed to indicate what the degree of visual field. So you, you can be impaired from driving by having a very narrow visual field as well. Um, and so visual field is an important thing, especially and in particularly in cars. I mean, the thing about cars is that, you know, and actually Stu, you know, our buddy Stu and you and I have always talked about, I mean, one of the, one of the papers I've always wanted to do, one of the studies I've always wanted to do is actually to show what the visual field defect is just with a car. Because, you know, you have all these impairments, right? You have the side part of the you know, windshield, um, your seat. So there's, there's already fairly decent amount of visual impairment in cars. There's also blind spots, as you know, um, in, in cars. And that's why there a lot of the new technologies out there where they have blind spot detectors are, are been very helpful. Um, but when you're, when you're driving, you got to be really careful because now, in addition to the already big blind spots you might have in your, in your car, now you have your own blind spot that you have because of your visual field, def because part of your vision is gone in glaucoma. And so with those, you know, if you have glaucoma, you just have to be really careful about making sure that you're moving your head more. You know, like when you're driving, it's kind of like when I was teaching my son how to drive, which, by the way, did not go very well. Um, I'm, I think both of us are still very traumatized by that experience. Uh, but uh, I think we'll get over it with a lot of therapy in the future. <laughs> but uh, the reality is that, um, that you know, you know it's, it's really important. I always emphasize, you know, you can't just look in the rear view mirror. You can't just look on the side mirror. You got to actually you know, turn your head and actually do that. And, and that kind of advice is really helpful uh, to people who have visual field defects when they're driving um, to base, basically, you know, sort of, you know, know where your visual field problem is and then make sure you're compensating for that when you're driving. And also, it also, you know, other thing that happens with, with, with one of the symptoms of uh, glaucoma, uh, which we didn't really talk about, is that their contrast sensitivity also goes down. And um, so the ability to detect differences between light and dark or the ability to, you know, um, to, to be able to, to do something, um, sorry, I get it. Sorry about that. Let's get a phone call. Can we cut this part right now? Are we, can we do a little section here? Uh, we we'll just keep going for one more, one more, and then we're going to, we're going to end in a minute. Okay, good, good, good. Sorry about that. Just cause my staff just called me. Okay. Um, any, yeah. But any case, um, 
um, the, the visual acuity can go down in ways that are not just like, you know, the ability to see contrast, light and dark. Okay, so the, the ability to see light and dark is, um, is really um, important in contrast. And, and that becomes something that you lose, not only with glaucoma, but you can lose it with macular degeneration, you can lose it with other, other diseases. And, um, you know, in that situation, the, um, the, um, the ability that, you know, the ability to drive, especially at nighttime or under really uh, non-optimal non conditions can be really problematic. And so um, it's really important to also recognize that, like, if you have glaucoma and your contrast sensitivity is down, um, it's important to be able to, you know, take into account, like, driving conditions at night, you know, be careful and so forth. Driving at night is really difficult. I never realized, you know, as I'm getting older, how difficult night driving really can be. And amber tinted lenses or yellow tinted lenses could be really helpful with people starting to lose their vision. But a recommendation to our glaucoma patients, make sure you drive with a family member and let them give you the okay to be able to drive because do not drive if you can't see properly because we know, you know, what, you don't want to put yourself at risk. You don't want to put others at risk. And just to add one other thing as far as falls go. People with yes. glaucoma are at greater risk of falling. My daughter is an occupational therapist. And one of the things they taught her in occupational therapy school, the one thing they taught her about the eye is people with glaucoma have a four times greater risk of falling. That's right. And so, I mean, any kind of, any kind of, uh, you know, again, these are all these neurodegenerative issues, right? You know, or just, you know, aging degenerative issues. Like when you're, when you get older, if you can't see as well, your balance gets worse. Um, when you get older, your muscles are not as strong. Your joints aren't as good. You know, your, your ability to, to your proprioception, which is knowing where you are in space, where your muscles are in space, all those things, your, your inner ear, all these things start to degenerate. So uh, vision is a, is a key one in terms of keeping your balance and being able to ambulate. And one of the leading more, you know, morbidities, meaning that one of the leading causes of, of, of problems in, in old, elderly and even young people is a fall. And I mean, I can't under emphasize how important, you know, the, the, there's a lot of crazy things that, that Medicare requires us to, you know, document. Um, some of them, you know, makes no sense from an ophthalmology or optom optometrist standpoint, but one of them that I actually think is really helpful and super, you know, good is like to ask people about their fall history, because, you know, if they've fallen and you know that, you know, it's really important because when you fall, it's just, it, it's like a cascade of events that occurs where everything starts to go down. You, you, you fall, you can't eat as well, potentially you can't ambulate, you can't exercise, your emotional, your psychiatric, you know, thing, it's just a, it's a cascade event that can really end in, with, in, in bad, in bad um, you know, bad outcomes. Well, I want to thank Dr. Harvey Fishman yeah. for joining me today and talking about the problem of glaucoma. We're going to have you come back. We're going to talk about treatment. We're going to talk about surgery. And we're going to talk about prevention. But if somebody wants to be able to get in touch with you, Harvey, and learn more about you, learn to become a patient of yours, what can they do? Hey, thanks for asking. Yeah, so I have a website, um, www.fishmanvision.com. Um, I can be also be found on Twitter at, at Dr. Fishman at Dr. Fishman. I also have a new podcast as well called um, I Chat with Dr. Harv, and I have <laughs> one episode so far, and uh, hopefully we'll be getting you on my episode, my show as well. And uh, so those are the places you can find me. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and thank you for joining me today. This is Dr. Kerry Gelb for Open Your Eyes. Thanks so much, Kerry. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEBroadcasting.com and sign up today. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. 
MacU Health with Micromicell, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicell technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also going to be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball, and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Will everyone please open their eyes? Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.